Hi, I'm Teresa Kanan with Stitch and Tree Quilts, and today I'm going to lead a quilt along for my pattern, Barns and Terraces, a jelly roll throw quilt. It's a super easy quilt, and I'm glad that you've joined us. Some of you are participating live online while we teach the quilt along. Others will be downloading the video later, whether from YouTube or from our stitchandtree.com website or from a website of one of the shops that's offering our pattern. And yet some of you may also be participating live from a different quilt shop across the country. However you decided to join us, I'm glad you're here. And along the way, I hope I'm able to answer any questions that you might have. Let's take a look at the way I normally will do any of my quilt alongs. Each quilt along will have a handout that goes with it that will have pictures and images like you see on your screen right now. It will have notes and pointers that are also enhanced by the video. In today's quilt along, we'll go over the materials and the supplies. We'll talk about your fabric selection. I'll do some cutting tips and then step by step, I'll go through every one of the items on the pattern. So in order to participate, you're going to need the Barnes and Terraces pattern. You can download it from our website as an electronic PDF. You can purchase it as a hard copy from our website, or you can look to other quilt shops across the country who are also offering the pattern. The thing you need to look for are the words Barnes and Terraces. Barnes and Terraces is my favorite go-to jelly roll quilt, and I'll talk a little bit about why in just a moment. The pattern itself measures 56 inches by 66 inches, and it's perfect for any jelly roll. If you don't have your border fabric picked out yet, don't worry about that because you can pick that out after you've done your quilt top. Roughly, it takes six to eight hours total cutting and construction time. Let's take a look at the quilt behind me. Earlier this week, I did a quilt along with the very same pattern, Barns and Terraces, and this is the quilt that I constructed using that quilt along. It's a fabric line called Sunrise Farms from Quilting Treasures, and I chose it because we're from the farm area, I'm a farm wife, and, and I love doing anything that's farm related. So in this particular quilt, I've got fabrics from the line, and I've added blenders to it. The pattern itself is perfect for any jelly roll, so just grab a jelly roll from your stash and it's something that you can work with. I always like this pattern when somebody in our shop finds a jelly roll but doesn't quite know what to do, then this is a perfect design for that. I'll show some images of different quilts along the way and then I'll show some good things and I'll talk about some things maybe to keep in mind as you're considering your jelly roll. So let's go ahead and take a look at other quilts that have been done with this pattern. This quilt is one that's done by Betty who works with us in our shop and she likes to do a lot of her quilts as a quilt of valor quilt. So she chose a patriotic line. So in her particular quilt, she just has four colors, a dark blue, a light blue, a white and a red. So note that Betty very evenly distributed the different um, colors as she worked on her quilt here and made sure that she had a little bit of every color in every area of her quilt you'll see that each set of barns that she has has a red, a white, and a blue. That's how she chose to, to make that work. This is a quilt that Liz gathered from her stash. She just jumped in and grabbed a bunch of brights and that worked really well as, for her also. This is a quilt that Quilter's Garden Online did and they did variations of grays and whites and blacks. Here's a quilt by Pat, she had the she had the jelly roll in her stash. She pulled it out when she put the quilt together. Then it became apparent what she needed to use for her border. She did not have her border picked out in advance. And here's a quilt from an ombre fabric line. And what's important here to note is that you can use an ombre fabric in your border, but I would not recommend an ombre for the actual barns or terraces because the colorations can change so much as you go. This one will show close up. I'll have it with me right behind me. This is from the Joy Christmas line. It also is a four color quilt. And what's important here to note is that you always have to make sure you have contrast between your barns and your terraces. Here's a quilt that Cindy did. She pulled a, a jelly roll and she chose for her barns to pull out the fabrics from her jelly roll that read as solid from a distance. You'll also note that she chose to have the inside, the lofts of her barns done in a same fabric. And she chose that fabric to put on her border. She chose to have a smaller border than what the pattern calls for. 
So I said I'd show you a few more things right here before we get started with our cutting and our and the other instructions. This was the quilt that I showed you earlier that is made from the Joy line. This quilt has directional fabric and non-directional fabric. I chose not to use any of the directional fabrics in my different barns. This part is the barn, this is the terrace, and the long straight lines. I'm sorry, this is the barn, this is the loft of the barn, and the long straight lines are the terraces. So I chose not to put the directional fabrics in my barns because you'll note that some of the barns have the long side going horizontal, and some of the barns have the long side going vertically. And I'll show that more later in the video as we do different parts of that. In this particular fabric line, there were only uh, four colors. There was white, blue, green, and red. And so it does make it a challenge when I'm having to put the whites in that I don't show too much white at one point in time. Another fabric line that I grabbed happens to be another Christmas uh, Barnes and Terraces quilt. And I grabbed this fabric line and it's a very, very, it was from Ho 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 and it's a very busy fabric line. And so one thing that I can say that I learned from doing this very busy quilt is it might have been in my best interest to substitute some of the fabrics in the jelly roll with some more calm, neutral, blender type fabrics because sometimes I have prints on prints that look so close and similar to each other, it makes it difficult to see the barn from the terraces. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. When doing a jelly roll quilt, not all the, the, the strips from the jelly roll necessarily have to go in the quilt. And in this particular design, I'll explain why we don't need to use all of the different strips. But one reason why I don't like to necessarily always put all the strips in is because sometimes when you're doing that, they might have the full line in the jelly roll, but maybe some just are gonna end up standing out separately and differently in your quilt. For example, I did one once that was in Halloween colors and they were orange, purples, greens, and blacks. But out of the entire set that was together, there was one fabric that was white with a black dot on it. And that one fabric, even though it was in the jelly roll, if I would have tried to include it in the quilt, it would have stood out so much it would have taken away from the quilt. So this quilt, like I said, is my favorite go-to jelly roll quilt, but it's also a great scrap quilt. So it's not uncommon when I put a binding on a fabric or on a quilt that I'll save what's left of my binding tails. And I'll take these scraps and use them and I can make a scrappy barns and terraces quilt. And then it's something I can easily give as a donation. Today for my quilt along, I chose a focus fabric from our stash here at the shop. And I literally cut a little kit just to go along with it. It's time for me to think springy and, and bright. So the fabric I chose was called Jubilee. And in this particular fabric, it's got pinks and reds and oranges, yellows, turquoise, and green. So we use the colors in this fabric. And in this case, this is gonna be my border print. So I use the colors in this fabric to help determine what I'm going to use in my actual quilt itself. And so I pulled a series of fabrics from my stash and I've made kits just from that. And that's what I'll be using today as, as I do our quilt along. Again, any jelly roll will work and I'll explain how you can make those work. Let me go ahead and move on to... So I talked a little bit about fabric selection. And one of the things that I want to always make sure that I point out, um, hang on here. One of the things I always want to point out is on your directional fabrics, a directional fabric can work. It's easier to use it in the terraces than it is to use it in the barns. Well, we can make it work in the barns as well. Also, if you're gonna use directional fabric, you are gonna need more fabric for your borders if you're using a directional fabric in your border. You're gonna to wanna to use at least three colors. As we show with Betty's quilt, that's red, white, and blue. We need at least those three colors to make things stand out or three shades, a medium, a light, and a dark, unless you're going for a truly monochromatic look. And I always encourage people to lay out some of their fabrics first and make sure they like the way they look together. If you don't like the way they look together before you start, you're not going to like the way they look together after you get started. Let's talk about some of the supplies that you're going to need. You're going to need your 
rotary cutter, your ruler, and your mat, whichever mat you like to use, anything can work. You're gonna need an iron and a pressing mat or an iron and an ironing board. And when I'm doing my work at my table, I like to use my wool mat and I like to use my little steam fast iron. And these are very inexpensive irons, but they run nice and hot and they make a really good press. You're gonna need your sewing machine, your needle, thread, some general sewing supplies. You need a design wall or space to lay out your design, even if it's on the floor or on the dining room table. You're just gonna need some space to do that. I like to sew with my pin pal and I like to use my chain ripper. Those are optional, you don't have to have them, but I'll explain how I like to use them. And one of the other things you're gonna to want to use are some rubber finger garden gloves. Yeah, you don't have to use those. They're gonna help with the pressing and I'll explain that later as well. All right, pull out your pattern and let's take a look at your pattern and the area on your pattern that is the cutting instructions. You'll notice on the cutting instructions that we have your cutting 14 strips for your barns, 14, 18 strips for your terrace, and six strips for your binding. So one of the things I do when I first start out with a jelly roll is I try to figure out which strips are gonna be my binding, which ones are gonna go around the edge of the quilt, and which ones are gonna go in the quilt. If you're using a jelly roll, you're gonna to have to pick those strips out first. If you're cutting from your stash, you can worry about your binding later. All right, I said before that directional fabrics work best if they're in the terraces. So if you've got directional fabrics, try to include those into these 18. You'll notice that 18 plus 14 equals 32. That means you're gonna be using 32 strips of your jelly roll for the actual quilt top. Six of those strips are gonna be for the binding. So as far as working out which strips you're going to use in your, gel, in your quilt top, since you need 32 of those and six are for binding, that leaves you at 38. It leaves you with a remainder of two strips. So you still can use those two strips in the quilt itself. Okay. When I am doing my cutting, I like to use a six and a half inch square up tool to cut my units. And I'll show you that on the cutting mat in just a moment. One strip is going to yield two barns and two lofts. So let me just point out here that in this quilt, you can see I have two barns that they're identical color, these yellow right here, that came from one strip of fabric. So one of the things to consider as you're figuring out which fabrics are gonna be your barns and which fabrics are gonna be your lofts is to consider, are they light, are they dark, Do they, are they good companions for each other? In this particular quilt, I had such a variety of fabrics that I just made sure that I had an even number from the variety, an even number of the blues, the greens, the reds, and the prints. When I did this quilt, the jelly roll had more whites in it than what it did red, greens, blues. And so I had to have more whites in my barns, which allowed me more color in my terraces. So again, you had to make the decision based on the jelly roll that you have. So one of the first things I always encourage people to do is to take their jelly rolls and start separating those out and laying them into piles so that you can decide which fabrics you'd like to have as barns and which fabrics you'd like to have as terraces. For an example, I'll be working with this fabric today and because it is directional, I think it's gonna make a better terrace than what it will a barn. So I'm gonna lay that in my terraces pile. There we go. All right, so we're gonna pause here just a moment so I can get my fabrics laid out and get ready to cut those. Okay, I have laid out the strips that I'm gonna be using for my quilt. And these are some strips that we've put together. Again, remember it was using this fabric 
as my color palette and this is going to be my border and these are the strips that we've put together with that and I have them laid into these are the 14 strips that I'm going to use for my barns and with my lofts and these are the strips that I'm going to use for my terraces and what I have done in this case in order to make my terraces and my barns look distinctly different was I chose the darker fabrics the fabrics that led the read the darkest in the line and I chose to put those into my barns and I chose to put the fabrics that read the lightest into my terraces and my idea behind that is in my barns are going to pop out pretty brightly now again remember you have two leftover strips and in my case I chose these two strips that are black with a little bit of a of a multicolored dot and I chose those because of the black that's on the leaves and the petals here for the flowers when you're cutting your strips for your barns, uh, you're cutting the pieces so that you do have enough to put inside the barn, the loft on the center of that. Or if you choose to, that with those two remaining strips, you could, if they're the same fabric, choose to make them be uniform. So for example, with this quilt, I chose one fabric to be uniform in the center of each one of my barns for my lofts. And with this quilt, I chose a contrasting loft to go with each barn. There's no right answer. You can do it either way, any way that you choose to. It's however you want your ending quilt to look. You can go ahead and cut your, your lofts in the center of each barn from your fabrics and see if you like that look. And if not, then you can cut them from two remaining strips. It's entirely up to you. So go ahead and take a little bit of time right now. Sort your fabrics out into piles. Step back, take a look, use your camera, do what you have to do to be able to get them sorted into sets of 14 strips for your barns with your lofts and 18 strips for your terraces. And once you do that, we'll be ready to cut. Okay, after looking at my strips a little closer, I made a few more substitutions. These are my darker, these are gonna be my barns, these 14 strips. These are my lighter, these are gonna be my terraces, the 18 strips. These are the two strips I'm going to use for the centers of my barns, my lofts. And this is my, my focus fabric that I'm using for my borders. So the thing I'm going to do first is lay those out and cut them, and I'm gonna start with cutting my loft units. Okay, when I am cutting my strips for my barns, I like to take my 42 inch strip that's folded at the fold and I fold it back over again so that I can see the selvage on the edge. So I don't make the mistake of cutting my strips in such a way that I end up with selvage on my pieces. So I make sure I get that cut off. I fold them in half again so that I have four layers of thickness because I need to have four of those six and a half inch rectangles. And so I'll slide those two together and I like to be efficient. So I typically will double up my fabrics so that I'm cutting through eight layers of fabric at a time. And the first thing that I do is I make an even cut so that I've cut off my selvages and I can discard those. So these pieces are ready for me to discard. I like to keep those in a little bucket and we put them into pet beds for the Humane Society. And then if you're using a six and a half inch ruler of any type, and this one happens to be a Marty Michelle square up ruler, uh, which I love this ruler because it has eighth inch markings. We don't need eighth inch for this pattern. But if you lay your ruler on, make sure that you're cutting your unit square. I'm even with this left side of my ruler. I have a line I can see across the top. I have a line I can see across the bottom. When I make that cut, I have all of the pieces of my six and a half inch pieces that I need for my quilt right there. And then what I have left here, I can cut my two and a half inch pieces from that. Again, I'm going to line up my ruler so that I can see 
that my units are squared. And I'll do the same here. And I will do the same for all 14 strips of my Barnes fabric. I use the remaining piece to cut my last two, two and a half inch squares out of those. And you'll have a little bit of waste, but not much. So after you've done your cutting, you will have your four six and a half inch units and your six two and a half inch units. These are the pieces we need for the barns. And then you'll use another color for your terraces. I'm sorry, then you'll use another color for your lofts, excuse me. So go ahead and finish cutting the rest of your barns and we'll come back when it's time to cut our terraces. Okay, Linda from Arizona asked me why we're cutting these strips individually instead of strip piecing them. And the answer is pretty simple. If we were to strip piece them, every set of three would always look exactly the same, even if it was a short uh, terrace or a long one. So I choose to cut them individually so I can have more variety in my quilt. For these terraces, it's easier if you open your fabric up instead of leaving it folded in half to cut. It's easier if you open your fabric up along your mat, you're gonna need the larger mat for this. And you're gonna lay those out, the strips out. I, I like to minimize my cutting whenever I can. So you'll see that I have six rows of three strips each. So by doing that, I'll have fewer cuts that I have to make. And this will take no time at all to get these cut. I like to cut the 26 and a half inch strips first, and then I go on to the 13. So I have them laid evenly on my mat, and they're nice and straight with the lines, both at the top and the bottom. And once again, I cut those selvages off. It's really important to cut the selvages off before you begin uh, because selvages can really make a mess of a quilt. And I can see that this row here needs to come over a little bit in order to catch all the selvages off. So in this particular case, I'll be using my mat as my measuring device since I don't have a ruler that, that rules to 26 and a half inches. I always prefer to use my ruler as my measuring device, but in this case, I have to use my mat. So I first cut off those little salvage ends, and again, I'm gonna save those and put those in that bucket for the doggy beds. And my next cut will be at 26 and a half inches. And with two cuts, I have my long strips all cut and ready to go. Then I simply slide my strips back down and I make my 13 and a half inch cuts. Okay, I have my strips laid back out again. All my 18 strips are here. They're in six piles of three. And I'm gonna make my 13 and a half inch cut for the short terraces. It's always important to kind of count or to measure twice. So whether you have to count the squares on your mat or you redo your math, make sure that you're counting before you cut because as Granny always says, you should measure twice and cut once. Once you've made that cut, you've got a nice little piece of this left. It'd be a great opportunity to cut some two and a half inch squares and sit them around in a bucket. That way someday when you need a bunch of scrappy two and a half inch squares, you've got your pieces cut and ready to go. Our next step will be to go to step one of your pattern on page one. So let's get organized. Okay, you can see here that I have cut my long terraces, short terraces, my barns, and my lofts. Before I get started, I'm going to count all my units to make sure that I have what I need, and then I'm ready to move to my design wall. Okay, grab your pattern and take a look right below the cutting instructions. It gives you a little bit of direction as to what to do next as far as organizing your barns and your lofts. 
Each barn is going to use two six and a half inch pieces and two two and a half inch pieces. The loft is going to be a contrasting fabric that's going to be in the center. And I'm going to show you some examples right here on the design wall behind me for the quilt that I'm making. So when you're constructing your barns and your, and your lofts, you have two options. You can cut the pieces as the pattern indicates, and you're going to have contrasting pieces for your lofts. Or you can use the two extra strips, as I described before, and you can insert those in the center of your lofts. It's an entirely up to you, whatever it is that you choose to do. So let me just talk a little bit about your barns and lofts. Once I have all my pieces cut, I actually lay them out on a design wall and I start moving my contrast units around so that I have good contrast. If my lofts don't have strong contrast in the quilt, then they're going to be hard to see. And again, I, I remind you of that example of that Christmas quilt that I had that was really busy and sometimes those lofts just disappeared. Uh, in this particular Christmas quilt, I've got good contrast with my lofts, so they show up quite nicely. If you don't take the time to get good contrast with your lofts, you're going to end up not liking your quilt very much because the barns aren't going to be distinctive. They're not going to show up. So once you have them laid out, I suggest you step back, step back 10 feet, take a look with a critical eye, and the easiest way to do it is to snap a picture with your cell phone or your tablet and look on the picture. Because once you do that, you'll find that something like this might stand out to you and show that this is really not enough contrast to go in that unit, and I need to change it and give it a little more contrast so that it shows up nicer when I finish my quilt. The other thing to check as you're looking at that is to check whether or not your fabric is directional. And I'll give you a couple of different examples. Uh, on this side, all of these fabrics I have on this side are not directional. On this side, the fabrics that I have are either obvious directional, like this fabric here, and you can see that I have that unit in going the wrong direction. I need to turn that because that'll be obvious to me when I go ahead and I complete my quilt. But these two units from a distance are not obviously directional. And let me switch my camera so that you can see that they are indeed directional. Okay, these are two of my fabrics that are not real obvious that they are directional, but when you look closely, they are. In this fabric, it has wide hashes and it has skinny hashes. And you can see that the skinny hashes are all going this direction on both of those pieces. So when I have this part of my barn, I have it going the right direction, but you can see this part of my barn, it is going the wrong direction. And that will show up in my quilt. So I'll have to make sure that I turn those the correct direction when I am piecing my, my loft units together. In this particular fabric, it's a little tiny, it's got a little tiny oval print. And it definitely goes this direction as I look at it closely. In this particular block, I have it going the wrong direction. So again, I have to turn those correctly. So as I do those and I have directional fabrics, I very often will go ahead and place my piece right on it so I know exactly where I need to place that seam when I'm running it through my machine. And it's always good to double check that as you're running it through your machine one more time. I've learned from, from my own personal mistakes that it's very easy to get those directional fabrics going the wrong direction. Let's go ahead and move to the machine and chain piece. Okay, to get organized, I take my barns units with their coordinating lofts that are gonna go with them, and I lay them on the left-hand side of my machine. And so typically, if I were going to use contrasting fabric, I'd have that contrasting loft laying right there with it. So as I'm running them through my machine, I can pair them up very easily and run them through my machine. Now in my case, I'm not using a contrasting fabric. I'm using this um, black with the small mini dot. So I'm gonna have it off to my right and I'm just gonna pair them together as we go. I like to always use a beginner 
and by using a little piece of fabric, in this case, I'm just using a scrap, to go ahead and begin with my stitching. By doing that, then I can go ahead and get started. Now again, remember where I talked about directional fabric, and in this case, the hashtags need to go the same direction. So by laying it on the fabric, I make sure that I am doing my hashtag the same direction as the fabric. I just place my other loft fabric over top of it. I run that through my machine. And I take the rest of the barn unit and I lay it down at the bottom of my table so that I'm ready to go with my next unit. And I will continue to do that and chain piece those until I have gone through all 27 barns. By chain piecing, see I'm double checking to make sure I have that going the right direction. By chain piecing those, I save time and I save thread. Let me show you how we go ahead and use a chain ripper to break those units apart. Okay, a chain ripper is simply a small seam ripper that is set in this plastic base and I sit it right next to my sewing machine. And then as I have chain pieced my units, as they come off the machine, I can just pop them apart on that chain ripper. And because it is a seam ripper, I can piece them as closely as one stitch apart to pop them apart. And then that way that I can just lay them directly in a pile and that pile is in the opposite order of the fabrics that I had stitched through my machine. So they're ready to go ahead and match up with the other pieces and run them right back through my machine. Okay, now that I have cut apart or used my chain ripper to take apart my little units that I have for my barns and terraces, I've got them back into piles on my sewing machine so that I can keep them organized. And because I used my chain ripper and I just dropped those into a pile in the reverse order of what I needed them, it's just ready for me to stitch. So I'm gonna open it back up, and now it's easy for me to see my directional fabric. And I'm going to run those units through the machine, and then my loft units are complete. Again, once I've taken the unit there, I can lay the top and bottom of the barn aside. Again, I'm gonna focus on making sure I get my directional fabrics going the correct direction. And I'm gonna chain piece these units. Once I have all 27 of those units pieced, I'm ready to press. You'll remember at the beginning of the video, I told you that an optional garden glove with a rubberized fingers was a tool that I use when I'm pressing. And I'm gonna show you how I use it for the barns and then later it's more important when I use it to press the terraces. This is just a simple garden glove that I picked up at the tractor supply store. You can pick it up at a garden su supply store. Even Walmart, even in the box stores would have that. And it's just a small, simple glove that's got the kind of sticky rubberized fingers. It's very inexpensive and it makes it easy to use. I just use one glove at a time. I don't need two because of that. My other hand is usually holding my iron. Let's take a look at how I do that. Okay, here I have my wool mat and my steam fast iron. I have my iron set at about three quarter the setting. Um, it's a very hot iron. I don't like to use steam in my iron. I don't like to use water because that does introduce stretch into the unit. And so what I do, if I were going to press these in a traditional method, I would set my seams with my iron and then press it open from this side to make sure I got a nice even press and that my quarter inch seam stays a true quarter inch seam um, because oftentimes if we don't press things well, that is one way that the unit gets off as far as size. And so again, I would set the seam, lay it open, and press the seam. The purpose of setting the seam is to make sure that you have a nice good tight um, heat that sets those threads in place and locks them in place in that seam. So that's a unit that I've done using the method that'd be more traditional. And now I'm going to show you my garden glove method.
with my garden glove method, I simply put my garden glove on and you can see that it's sticky enough that it can spread those parts of the block apart. Now the garden glove works really well anytime I'm trying to spread a seam and I'll show you later how I use it with the terraces. Um, it's, it's a lot safer to use a garden glove that has some stick -um than trying to use your fingers and, and make those sticky yourself. I like to hold the iron onto the seam for the count of five bananas. I taught my granddaughters that if they count to five bananas, it's five full seconds, and then that will set the seam as well as press that seam open. And so they'll count bananas or Mississippis or whatever they need to count to get to their five seconds. We tend to get in a hurry and not spend time pressing, but if we press well, those units will measure well when we go to try to make them into our barns. So once again, I use my garden gloves to hold those apart. And you can see that when I hold those apart, I have ways that I can make sure that that unit is straight. And that's really important as well. So one banana, two banana, three banana, four banana, five banana. Do that and press all 27 of those units. Okay, once I have pressed my barn and loft units together so that they're ready to go, I lay them back out on my machine table so that I'm ready to just stitch and I can chain piece once again. So I'm going to lay the top part of my barn unit together. And I don't use a pin, it's only six and a half inches. As long as I have stitched that first quarter inch seams correctly, they should match up perfectly at the end. And I run those through my machine and I just go ahead and chain piece the barn tops onto those loft units and do that for all 27 units. So I'll set this one aside because it's the rest of that barn. I'll go ahead and work my next unit through again chain piecing those and I'll do that for all 27 units once I have the tops all on I'll run them back through my machine to put the bottom of the unit on and then you can see here, I've got a mistake. I, I did this directional fabric the wrong direction, so I'll have to fix that. But then I'll put the bottom of the unit on and I'll be ready to press those out into the barn settings. Okay, now that I have the top and the bottom of each barn unit put together, it's time to press them. And the pressing instructions tell you to press it to the outside. Again, I like to use my garden gloves and I like to hold that in place for five minutes five bananas and now that I have that barn unit all pressed nicely I like to take my square up my six and a half inch square up ruler and place it on top to see if I need to trim any part of the block and make sure that my quarter inch was true. And in this case, you can see my block is perfectly square and it's ready for me to go ahead and place in my quilt top. Go ahead and press all 27 of your barn units. Okay, I'm back now and I have my barn units constructed and I'm ready to lay them out. And I strongly suggest that you take your 27 barn units and you lay them out in such a way that you can see how they're going to look in their sets of three because it's very important that you look for some equal dis uh, distribution of colors and values throughout your quilt. You want your quilt to be harmonious. Have you ever looked at a quilt and you know you don't like it but you're not sure why you don't like it? It might be because the balance of the quilt is, is off or the colors are distributed unevenly, and your eye sees that even though you're not recognizing that, and your brain sees it, and then you have an aversion to that quilt. 
So I go ahead and I lay mine out on, on some sort of a design wall, or like I said, lay it on the floor, do what needs to be done so that you can see it. And then I step back and I take a look. And so for example, I have um, blue ending in three of my blocks. And so I have nine blocks total, so that's not too bad. But I have a light blue here and a lighter blue here, and this is a darker blue. So I might go ahead and swap this one out to bring that dark there and then take a look at that and take another look to see how I like the way that looks. And I'll continue to move the blocks around. Remember, we had an extra block, and that's an opportunity for us to take a look and decide whether or not we want to use that in place of something else in the quilt. But you're gonna do this and you're going to lay your blocks um, out and step back, take a picture, take a look at it, and then redesign how that might look when you go ahead and make your final quilt. I know it looks like I have orange touching orange, but the truth is they won't be anywhere near each other in the quilt. So once you do that, then I want you to go ahead and lay them in the, in the rotation the way they're going to be on the block sets. So in this particular case, the long edge of the barn is here. The long edge of the barn goes horizontal and the long edge of the barn goes vertical. That way I'm ready to go ahead and stitch those using a quarter inch seam. And then you're going to press them towards that long edge. So in that case, you're gonna press those to the outside and that allows that to lay nice and flat for you. Go ahead and do that and construct your nine sets of three of your barn units. Okay, now we're ready to lay out our terrace units. I've placed my barn units back on my design wall and I've got my terrace units laying across the table here and I'm gonna literally just start adding them and looking at each one as I add them to make sure that I'm distributing the colors and the, the values evenly. This is where my pin pal comes in real handy because I can just take the pins directly off my pin pal and place them right on the actual design. And I can see here, I don't like that pink right below this pink. So I'm probably gonna swap it around with a different one. So I'll continue to add the pieces until I am satisfied with the look of the total quilt. And I strongly recommend doing this rather than just sewing these into strips of three and hoping that they look nice wherever you lay them. It's a lot easier if you actually spend a little time and design your, your quilt so it lays out nicely. Even if you are doing a scrappy quilt, it's always good to make sure that your colors are balanced, to make sure that your values are balanced, and to make sure that the overall look of the quilt is harmonious. So take some time and lay out your quilt now. Okay, now you can see that I have my long and short terrace units laid out together with my barn set. And now is the time to step back and take a picture or even just eyeball it, but I like to take a picture with my iPhone. You can use a tablet, you can use your laptop, whatever you like to use as far as taking a picture so that you can take a look at the value the way you have your, your terraces laid out. For example, yellow is a very strong color. It's the color in the spectrum that reflects the most light. So yellow is always gonna be the first thing that draws your eye to the quilt. So for me, I have to make sure that my yellow strips are evenly distributed in the quilt. But I can see here that this unit, because the yellow here is very dark, and this yellow is very dark, it makes this unit over here look very pale by comparison. So with this much dark yellow on this side of the quilt, I might need to move something over to this side of the quilt to balance it out. So I'm gonna step back, take a picture, and then I'm gonna be ready to stitch my units in place. So you're gonna go ahead and follow the next instruction as far as stitching those together using your quarter inch seam. And before you press, I wanted you to take a look at the video so I can show you how you can press and make sure Sure that your strip sets don't end up making a smiley face, that they're not pressed into a curve. So go ahead and st stitch your strip sets together, get your terraces put together, but make sure you take a picture of the way it looks on your design wall before you start sewing so you make sure you can put your strip sets back in the exact spot where they belong. All right, I've identified my, my 
final placement from my quilt top and now it's time to piece my strips together. Once I've pieced my strips together into strip sets of three, like this unit here, then I need to press them and I'm gonna press them using two tools in addition to my iron and my pressing mat. I'm gonna use this little three and a half inch um, or this little three inch uh, ruler. It's a Marty Michelle ruler. It doesn't matter what ruler you use. This is just a way to make sure that your press seams stay nice and straight. And of course, I'm gonna use my garden glove. So let me show you what we're gonna do. So the pattern calls to press the seams to the outside and that's the easiest way to do that. And have you ever noticed sometimes when you're pressing strip sets together that they start to get a bit of a curve to them? They make a smile, if you will, and then they don't hang straight on the quilt when you finally finish your quilt top. Well, I have learned that if I place a ruler on my pressing mat or on my ironing board, and I use that to keep my top row straight, every row after my top will be straight as well. So again, I'm gonna use my sticky gloves to drive my iron on the first pass, just straight down. And then I'm gonna make sure that I set that on for five bananas everywhere. And you can see that this strip set is perfectly straight. And by doing that, I keep any sort of a twist or a, a turn out of my quilt. Now, it doesn't matter if I'm doing the small 13 and a half inch pieces or if I'm doing the long 26 and a half inch pieces, I follow the exact same method. I'll just lay that right next to the ruler. Use my garden gloves to divide that seam and push it nice and wide and just drive straight down the center, pressing to the outside. Count my five bananas to set those seams. Move it down and continue to make it straight. This is actually just a little trick that my grandmother showed me once. And at quilt shows, they'll sell you all sorts of expensive tools that can help you to make a straight press. And the truth is, if you just press it straight in the first place, there is no problem. So again, I've made a perfectly straight press, as you can see there, and I'm able to put it up on my wall in the spot where it belongs. As well as the other smaller piece that came from my wall. And I'll continue to do that. You can see that those are nice and straight. I'll continue to do that all the way until I've pieced all of my strip sets, my terra sets together. So take a little time and go ahead and put your strip sets together. Get them placed back on your wall. Make sure the way they are, that they're in the position where they're supposed to be. Compare it to the picture that you took earlier. And once you're finished with that, you're ready to start sewing your strip sets directly to your barn unit. Okay, we're just about finished. We're down to step six and seven of the pattern. And in step six and seven, we have you stitching your terra sections to your barn units. Now, if you've got an older version of our pattern, it tells you to press to the outside. If you've got a newer version, it tells you to press towards the barn units. So whichever one you do, I would suggest pressing towards the barn units. That way you'll be pressing those seams towards a straight piece of fabric and it'll allow it to lay flatter. Go ahead and stitch those pieces together and press them at this time. You'll make nine separate rows and then we'll put the rows together after that. 
All right, now that you have your terrace units stitched to your barns and pressed towards your barns, the pattern calls for you to go ahead and put your rows together. Now this is another reason why this is one of my favorite patterns. There are absolutely no seams to match up. So it's really nice, there's not a lot of perfection that you have to look at it. And because there are no seams to match up, you really, there's no wrong way to do this. I still recommend pinning the beginning, the end, and the middle because it makes it so that you're not stretching those rows as you're putting them together. Now in the pattern, it tells you to press your seams open. And the truth is it really doesn't matter which way you press them, it's up to your personal preference. If you press the seams open, there's less bulk when you're trying to put this, press this here, there's less bulk where those seams come together. But you truthfully can press it all one direction or the other, it really won't matter when you go to quilt it. If you are gonna hand quilt it, I would recommend pressing your seams open. So go ahead and get your quilt top pressed and let's get ready to put the borders on. And I wanna to talk to you about whether or not you straight piece of border or diagonal piece of border. Okay, we have our quilt top piece together and it's time to put our borders on. And before we measure and we cut the border, I wanna first talk about a little bit about whether or not you're going to diagonal piece your border or straight piece your border. First of all, when you're taking your border strips, cut those selvages off. I really always caution quilters to cut the selvages off before they begin sewing. Think about a towel that you've had hanging in your bathroom and after a number of times that you've washed it, that towel will pucker along the embroidered edge of the towel and leave you with a very wrinkly looking towel. That's essentially what salvage will do when you use it inside your quilt and you don't cut it off because it has a tighter weave on that salvage than it does on the rest of the fabric. So as the quilt gets laundered, that salvage is gonna pucker up and tighten a little bit and create a pucker in your quilt. So always, always cut your salvage off before you work with it. So now, the next part when you're going to, to put your borders on a quilt, you should always measure the length of your quilt first. So a lot of people have asked me, what part of the quilt should I measure? In a quilt like this one, if you measured the outside edge, the chances are you're gonna end up with a number that's longer than the number that you're looking for. Because we have so many of those seams along the edge that as we pull that out to measure that, we might actually stretch that. So I always encourage quilters to lay the quilt flat, measure the side, measure the middle, measure the other side, and determine what the measurement is. This quilt should measure 56 and a half inches. So before you cut those side border strips, measure first. Measure first and cut the border strips to match what your measurement is. The next thing is to question whether or not we should straight piece the border or diagonal piece the border. And the truth is, it's entirely up to you. But there's some cautions to take when you're gonna diagonal piece. So let's take a look at the difference. Some quilters say they diagonal piece so that they, if they have a print, it creates an, a line that's diagonal so you don't obviously notice where those two pieces come together. So on this border strip, this is diagonal piece. And you can see that a red flower is coming into a yellow, a pink into a yellow, and a pink going into a red. So I have three flowers that are interrupted there. Do I notice it because it's diagonal? I, I don't know, maybe I do, maybe I don't. On this side over here, I straight pieced it. I do have some spots where some flowers are cut off. And I have some spots where some flowers are touching each other, red and yellow there. So I don't know if there's one that is more disruptive to you than the other. You have to decide which one you prefer. But if you are going to diagonal piece your border, always subtract an eighth of an inch from the length of the border strip for any border piece or any anytime you're using it for sashing or anything else if you diagonal piece for every diagonal piece seam in that strip reduce the strip by an eighth of an inch diagonal piecing will introduce bias into that strip and stretch into that strip that isn't in a strip that is straight pieced so frequently unless it really is going to improve the look of the quilt I'll just straight piece my border pieces, and that way then I don't introduce any stretch into the length of the quilt. So once you have cut their, your side pieces to length, go ahead and stitch them onto the sides. You're gonna to want to press the, you're gonna to want to pin first the outsides, then the center, 
and then spots in between. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Okay, I have my border pieces on the sides cut to length, which was 54 and a half inches. And I'm gonna take my pins. I love wearing my pin pal because it makes it easy. And I'm gonna pin both the outside edges first. And this is easy to do because it's a small throw quilt. If it were a larger quilt, I would have actually marked my centers. But because this is such a small quilt, I can just fold it in half to get my center. And then pin the center piece. And use the same method to fold with what's remaining of my border in half. And then pin my center of that. Now what happens if you don't pin your border on? What happens with that is if you just sit down and start sewing, you're going to introduce stretch into one part of the quilt. And then as you work towards the end and you're trying to catch up and make sure that the two pieces come out together, you're introducing stretch into another part of the quilt. So oftentimes when I put a quilt on the frame, I can tell if that's the way a quilter has pieced her border on, his or her border on. I can tell if they just sat down and started sewing or if they took the time to pin and that way then they can make sure that they distribute the bulk of the quilt evenly throughout the border piece. Now I like to sew with my actual seam side up because then I can make sure that I'm, I'm sewing in such a way that I don't uh, push the seams the wrong direction. Uh, typically though, whatever you would choose to do as far as your, as far as your quilt goes, um, it, whichever way it works best for you is just fine. But I like to sew when I'm putting my border pieces on, I like to sew with my seams up where I can see them. Go ahead and sew your side border pieces on and then press it to the outside, to that outside border piece. Okay, my quilt top's complete, and I'm really excited about it. I told you I had one more thing to add to it that, that you might not have considered to doing in the past. Every time when I finish a quilt, whether it has a pieced edge or straight edge border, I will stitch 1 8 or 1 16th of an inch all the way around the quilt. That helps keep the quilt nice and square, and it keeps it from stretching when I'm quilting it on my, on my machine quilter. Your quilter will appreciate that you do that for, for her or for him, or if you're quilting it yourself, you'll notice how much that keeps your, your quilt top nice and square as it's being quilted. I hope you've enjoyed Barns and Terraces. I've enjoyed spending this time with you. If you have any questions along the way, give us a call, send an email. All of our information is on our website. Or if you're doing this quilt with another quilt shop, you can always ask questions of them. Thank you very much, and have a great day.